Welcome to the Austin, Texas Living Channel. I'm Tiffany Moore. I'm a local broker and realtor right here in Austin, Texas. In this video, we're going to talk about the top five frequently asked questions that I get from people who are relocating to Austin, Texas. And specifically, we're going to talk about property taxes. This is a really big topic. I talk about this on every single call and talk about different neighborhoods to live in, what it's like to live in the city, is Austin walkable, and then we're going to talk about schools. As I mentioned before, I'm a local realtor and broker right here in Austin, Texas. I help people from all over the world relocate to Austin. So if that sounds like you, you can see my email address and my phone number here. Jot it down if you want to give me a call, text, whatever is more comfortable for you. Any way you want to get in touch with me, I've got your back when you're moving to Austin. And I'll make sure you get all of your questions answered. Please excuse me today. It's like crazy allergies in Austin. And I just had like a very spicy lunch and my nose is running for so many different reasons. So bear with me. It's going to be okay. So let's get right to it. One question that I get a lot, like all the time a lot, is how much are property taxes? So first, I want to put a disclaimer out there that I am not a tax attorney. I'm not an accountant. So this is not legal advice or tax advice. I encourage you to do your own research. I'm just sharing with you my opinion, my knowledge, my experience, all that stuff. But it's not legal advice. So taxes are a lot. And how much they are really depends on the neighborhood and the area that you're living in in Austin. So within the city of Austin, most of the homes there are older and the tax rate is pretty low. The tax rate is going to be anyone from like 1.1 to 2.1%, um, usually close to like 1.4 to 1.9. So um, where taxes are higher is where we have new construction. So in the new construction communities, tax rates are anywhere from like 2.6 to 3.2%. So the reason for that is a lot more resources are going into the development of the neighborhoods. There are a lot more government resources that go into it. And there are fewer people in those neighborhoods when you first move in to kind of distribute the tax burden. So as more people fill into the neighborhood, as it gets older and that tax um, purchase is basically bought down, the tax rate will go down, but it takes several years to do that. That's why homes in Austin are have like a tax rate of 1.4%. And they were built in like the 1960s, 1970s. So let's look at what that actually looks like for the numbers. And I'm going to use some basic numbers here just for easy math. So let's say your tax rate is 2.5% and you buy a $600,000 house. 2.5% of that is $15,000. And so if you are escrowing your taxes, which means you're paying monthly to the mortgage company, then that is going to be additional $12.50 a month. So when you escrow, basically you have your principal that you're paying and your interest. And then on top of that, you're paying your taxes to the mortgage company. They're collecting it all for you. And then they're going to pay the taxes when they're due on January 31st. Because the mortgage company doesn't want you to default on your taxes and then have this lien against the house or have the state take it away. So they're going to make sure that that doesn't happen. If you choose not to do escrow for your taxes, you can keep that money in like a savings account and pay it on your own. But one way or another, you're going to have to be prepared to pay, you know, uh, $15,000 in taxes, whether you're paying it monthly to the mortgage company or you're setting aside money on your own to make sure that they're paid. Just make sure that they're paid on January 31st. So let's talk about the homestead exemption. So what this does is it reduces the taxable value of your house. And right now in the city of Austin and Travis County, Williamson County, it reduces it by $40,000. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to save you that much money, but this is where the big savings come in, is along with that $40,000 break that you get off the taxable value, you also get a 10% cap on the increase of the value of the taxable value of your home. So I'm going to kind of spend a little bit of time on this because it can get a little bit complicated. So basically this 10% cap limits the increases of the total assessed value to 10% from year to year. So let's say your assessed value is 400,000 one year with that 10% cap, even if the market value of your house is like 600,000, like what we've been seeing in the past few years, it's like it skyrocketed from one year to the next. When you have that homestead exemption, it can only go from 400,000 to 440,000 because you have that 10% cap. And then the effects of this year after year are massive. So my husband and I have owned our home for 11 years. We've had that 10% cap since the second year we lived in there. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so basically when I got my tax bill last year, because of this 10% cap, 
uh, I'm paying my, my house is the taxable value of my house is about $150,000 less than what it would be if I didn't have that 10% cap because every year it gets capped at 10%. So if you're living in your house for a while, that savings is going to add up significantly. So here is the deal. This 10% cap takes effect on January 1st of the tax year following the first year you're qualified for the exemption. So when you, the first like incomplete year that you own the home, like let's say you buy the home in October of 2021. For the remainder of October of 2021, you get to ride the previous owner's homestead exemption. You get whatever they had. So in 2022, that's when you file your homestead exemption for your own, because that's when you actually qualify for it. And then you're going to get this 10% cap in 2023. So here is the kicker. In 2022, when you get your tax bill in, you don't get the 10% cap yet. And so let's say you bought a house from someone like me, who I've owned my house for 11 years. I've had this 10% cap every year. And all if I didn't have the homestead exemption, let's say my house would be, the taxable value would be like 600000 but I do have this homestead exemption, so they can only tax me on 450. Well, when I sell my house to you in October of 2021, and now you're responsible for the taxes in October of 2022, they're gonna tax you at that $600,000 value because you don't have the benefit of that 10% cap yet. You don't get that until 2023. This is where a lot of people get tripped up. They're like, I filed my homestead exemption. Why is it so much money? Like, yes, you filed your homestead exemption and you get the benefit of that um, $40,000 exemption immediately, but you don't get this 10% cap until the second year that you live in the house. That's the easiest way to understand it. And so that first year that you that you live there, your taxes are going to go up and this is going to be your new normal tax rate. So in 2023, your taxes can only be 10% above this rate. They're never going to go back down. All right. Frequently asked question number two is just about the different neighborhoods. What are the different neighborhoods? Where should we live, etc.? So there are so many different neighborhoods and communities and suburbs. There's no way to compare them all. Instead, I encourage people to think about the lifestyle that you want to live and what's important to you to be close to and also the price range that you're comfortable with. So this is really going to help you narrow down what area we can look in. And these are some of the things that we talk about on our call. So if you're moving out here and you want help with this, my contact info is in the description. These are some of the questions that I'm going to help walk you through um, so we can figure out what is the right area for you based on the lifestyle that you want to live, the house you want, and really the price range. So the price range is going to be a really big factor. And I encourage you to start with your total monthly payment that you're comfortable with and work backwards from there. So you know what your budget is, you know what your financial plans are, what your goals are, where you're putting your money, you know how much money you can set aside for your housing payments. And by that, I mean your mortgage payment being your principal and your interest. If you're escrowing your taxes, you need to include that tax payment in there and your insurance. So insurance is going to be anywhere from like 150 to 200 a month, depending on the coverages that you get and the size of the house and all that good stuff. In general, here's some really general rule of thumb, like back of the napkin math you can do. For every $100,000 that you borrow, plan on paying $650 to $700 per month for your principal and your interest. So let's say you borrow $500,000. $3,250 to $3,500 is going to be your principal and your interest, just your principal and your interest. So if you have, if you bought the house for $600, you put down $100, and you borrow $500. You're going to pay about $3,500 for your principal and your interest. And then we're going to add the taxes of about $1,250. And we did that math before. We're going to add taxes of about $1,250. So your total monthly payment is about $4,750 a month. We're going to add in homeowner's insurance. Let's spend on that being about $200 conservatively. So now we're at about $5,000 a month for a $600,000 home. Also keep in mind, if you're not putting down 20% of the purchase price, then you will need to pay mortgage insurance, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, everyone thinks that mortgage insurance is like, oh, it's ridiculous, you're throwing away money. If it's gonna get you buying a home sooner and like not paying rent to your apartment complex or your landlord, then that's the right move. You know, if it's going to make you a homeowner sooner than you saving that 20%, if it's gonna take you another two to three years to save that 20%, in the meantime, prices are gonna go up. The market's going to keep moving. It's not going to wait for you. So whatever you think is 20 to 30% now, it's going to be more money in a couple years. 
So if you can lock in that price now and just pay the mortgage insurance, and then over time, as the market does go up and as you are able to like put additional money towards your mortgage, you can get rid of that mortgage insurance depending on how the market goes, how much money you're paying towards your principal, all that stuff. So that's some general information about prices. Um, in general, when we talk about neighborhoods, the further you get from Austin, the more affordable things are. The closer you are to the city, the more expensive everything is going to be. So some of the more affordable areas around Austin right now are Maynard, Hutto, and Kyle. Those are kind of on the east side. So Maynard is far east, Hutto is northeast, and Kyle is basically just like straight south of Austin. Um, some of the more expensive areas around Austin right now are just in the middle of the city of Austin, Lakeway and Bee Cave. So Lakeway and Bee Cave are going to be on the west over towards um, the lake, you know, over towards the Colorado River. And the areas that are going to be somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between most affordable and least affordable are Leander, Georgetown, Liberty Hill, Cedar Park, Round Rock, and Pflugerville. So most of the new construction that's going on is happening in Leander, Georgetown, and Liberty Hill. Pflugerville's got a lot going on, but it's not as much as some of those other areas. And that Leander area is going to experience so much growth in the next several years that I really like that area for buying a home right now. So there are pros and cons to each of these areas. The good news is there's no wrong answer. If there's no wrong answer, it's all up to you, your personal preference, the lifestyle you want to live, and what your priorities are. So these are some of the factors that we're going to dig into on our call. Third question is about living in the city. So a lot of people want to live in the city and they want to live the Austin lifestyle and go to the shows and the restaurants, shop at the shops and go to the bars. And Austin is awesome. I love living here. Um, I'm a little bit biased, but like it's a really cool place to be. But I want to set some expectations um, about what it's like to live in Austin. One, I just mentioned this, housing is expensive. In the city of Austin is the most expensive place to buy a house per square foot. Hands down, there's no questions asked. So if you want to live in the city of Austin, price range is going to have to be a little bit higher than if you want to live in Maynard or Hutto, Round Rock or Pflugerville. And the style of homes that are available in Austin um, is not very variable. So a typical like suburban home that you would think of with like two car garage, maybe two stories, four bedrooms, two to three baths, 2,500 square feet. Those homes do not exist in Austin proper. Take that back. They do exist. They're going to be over the million dollar price range. So if that's not your price range and you want that kind of house, that's a suburb style house. We're going to look in the suburbs for that. The homes that you're going to find in Austin are closer to about 1,200 square feet to maybe 1,700, 1,900 square feet. They're going to be mostly single story ranch homes. And they're going to be around $700,000. So that's like a typical uh, assessment of the Austin market and the price range and everything right now. Also, traffic is pretty ridiculous in Austin. So again, if you're coming out here from California, you're probably used to it. But do you want to like recreate that environment or are you moving out here for something different? So within the city, it's not too bad. But if you're driving around Austin around rush hour, like between 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. or in the afternoon between 3 and 7 p.m., it's going to be busy. Like It's going to take you a lot longer to get places. And if you don't want that, you're not used to that, um, it's just something to keep in mind. Also, parking can be tricky. So I just mentioned that the typical like suburban home with a two-car garage, you're not really going to find it in Austin. Most houses in Austin are either going to have a carport or just driveway parking or street parking. There are a few homes and some of the newer kind of townhouse style homes that they're building that have a garage. Some have a two-car, some have one car. But if we're talking about like a typical Austin home, that single-story ranch home, there's not a lot of like off-street parking. It's either going to be parking on the street or like carport parking or driveway parking. So if you need the garage for like a workshop or a man cave or hobbies or something like that, that's going to be more typical to find in the suburbs. Okay, the next frequently asked question is, is Austin walkable? And this isn't really, I take that, this isn't really a question. This is more of like a preference that people have. And then I have to educate them like, long story short, no, Austin is not walkable. So you are going to need a car in Austin. It's a pretty big city and we don't have grocery stores and bodegas and little coffee shops and restaurants on every corner. This is not a New York City or a Boston or a London or a Chicago. Um, it's a commuter city. And so we have our huge HEB grocery stores 
and you drive there because the parking lot is huge and you load up your groceries for like one to two weeks. I get my groceries every two weeks. I cook a lot. Um, I freeze stuff. So that's my lifestyle. If you are used to going every day or just getting something for one day, it's going to get tedious. It's going to get old because the grocery stores are very busy. Parking lots are huge. Um, you only really want to go there once a week or once every two weeks. We do have a basic light rail system, but it's pretty minimal. It's more like a commuter rail. So it kind of shuts down around seven o'clock every night. So if you're going from South Austin to the suburbs or North Austin, like I hope you, your meeting gets out on time. Um, otherwise you're going to miss the train. So, and then on Saturdays, it doesn't even start running until like 1230 or one o'clock in the afternoon. So there's no like taking it downtown for brunch on Saturdays. It doesn't even run on Sundays. It really is just a commuter rail and they're working on expanding it, but Today, that's what it is. It's not very robust. Um, it's not going to take you everywhere that you want to go in the city. You will need at least one car per household if one of you is working from home. If you have a two-person household and one works from home, one car is fine. Um, if you both work away from home, you're going to need two cars. There's just no way that both of you can get to where you need to be with one car. So if you're looking for a home where you can walk to your favorite coffee shop or bookstore or a restaurant, there are a few tiny little pockets like that. But by and large, um, we just plan on driving. The fifth question that I get asked about all the time is about schools. So here's my disclaimer on schools. One, all the information I'm going to give you is from greatschools.org. So I highly encourage you to check out that website. It's got data points on like every different thing you can think of for every single school. And not just the schools, but the school districts and all that good stuff. So I highly recommend you check that out. It's got a ton of good insight for you. Um, so definitely start there. So whether you have kids or not, or you homeschool your kids, you may still be interested in school districts. So like I said, first check out greatschools.org. What I'm sharing today is going to be a summary of all the data that you can find on that site. So in general, the schools in the city of Austin are not very highly rated on greatschools.org. So if you want to be in the city of Austin, but your number one priority is good schools, those two things are not going to work out. The best school district in the city, according to greatschools.org and the ratings and everything, is the EANES Independent School District. It's E-A-N-E-S. And that is going to be just to the west of Mopac on the west side of Austin, kind of as it blends into Lakeway and Bee Cave. And the second uh, most highly rated school district is the Lake Travis School District. So that's going to be the Lakeway and the Bee Cave area and um, yeah, that area in general. Those two schools have got the, the school districts have the highest ratings from greatschools.org. Um, the next runner up is going to be the Leander Independent School District, which is going to be like Cedar Park, Leander, and a little bit as it blends into Lakeway, like in the Steiner Ranch area. So if schools are your number one priority, the neighborhood that's going to feed into the Eanes Independent School District is going to be on the west side of Austin. If you're looking at Google Maps, look at like the Rollingwood area, that is going to be a good indication of um, the neighborhood location that you need to stay in if you want to go to Eanes Independent School District. Also, if you just go to greatschools.org and look at, there's a map of where the schools are, it's obviously going to be a good indication of what neighborhoods you need to live in if you want to be going to those schools. Pro tip, and probably doesn't come as a surprise, but the best schools are in some of the most expensive neighborhoods. So if it's like, oh yeah, cool, I want to send my kid to the best public school in Austin and my budget's $500,000, that's not going to work. Um, we're looking at closer to a million up for the Eanes Independent School District and probably around eight or nine in the Lake Travis School District. So just something to keep in mind. So these are the questions that I get most frequently from folks that are relocating to Austin. You can see my contact info is on the screen right here. Jot it down, whether you want to email, text, or call me, whatever's more comfortable to you. Reach out to me. I've got your back. I'm going to make sure you're taken care of when you are moving to Austin.